So today we're going to talk about one of my favorite things, and that's history. I love history, and we started thinking that, you know, people hear about history, but they don't know a whole lot about their financial history. So especially how we got to where we are today. So we put together uh, a series of historical financial history, and we're going to go over to that in, uh, more. First, I wanted to have a few little disclaimers here, disclosures, just give you a second or two to dis, uh, decipher that. Uh, we're going to be recording this, so you can always come back later and read that thing in its entirety. Very exciting stuff, but um, obviously what we've got to do. So as I said before, we decided that we were going to come up with something in the around financial history because, you know, really very few people understand how we got to where we are today in terms of our money and in our and on our financial financial system. So we jumped right in with World War One and after because you know really World War One changed everything. And so really we were starting with the Weimar Republic. And then after Weimar Republic we're talking about the Dawes plan, Charlie Dawes's plan to 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 get things back on set settlement there. And then that brings us to the Bank of International Settlements, which we'll talk a little bit about. And then, of course, World War II um, and then the Bretton Woods Agreement. Maybe you've heard about the Bretton Woods Agreement, but I doubt you could tell me what happened there. Um, also, International Monetary Fund. This is something that you hear about, but you don't really understand, maybe. And it's going to be coming more and more into the forefront, along with the World Bank. We'll see that happen. So this is our financial hi history series. Uh, we're going to hit touch on the first two here today and we'll just barely talk about the Bank of International Settlements, but that will be a topic of the next uh, webinar, that and also World War II, and we might even be able to touch on the Bretton Woods Agreement there in a, in a little while. So, like all things recently, believe it or not, it's been over 100 years, but most things um, today still harken back to World War I. World War II was just really a repeat of World War II, World War I in a bigger way. World War I, you have to remember, was really the first war that was paid for with central banks. The, the war before that was the Franco-Prussian War, uh, which was be between Prussia, the German states, and then also France. So they already hated each other. Um, and that goes all the way back to the Napoleonic Wars and probably even goes back before that. So. There was already tensions built up there, but then you know it started down in the Balkans with uh, with the with the assassination there of Arch Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo. Um, so we're not going to talk about all those politics because we're going to focus really on the finances of stuff. Germany during World War One was a unified monarchy during 1871 through 1918, and that was mainly under you know the, the Habsburg Empire. The, the German Empire was allied with Austria and Hungary and in the Ottoman Empire. And you know, basically during that period of time, they called the Ottoman Empire Europe sick, sick member, or sick, sick, the, sick, the sick man, the old sick man of Europe, the Ottoman Empire, because it was crumbling. And the Ottoman Empire was at that time very heavily involved in the Balkans. And so uh, really World War I kind of became a racial thing. It was almost a racial thing between the Germans and the Teutons or the Teutonic tribes and the Slavic tribes that were down in Serbia. Uh, and so that, unfortunately, you, you would think it might be economic, but ultimately it, it started out as sort of a racial thing. These are the days of Hindenburg and Ludendorff, but no, that's not the blimp. Um, that's uh, von Hindenburg and, and Ludendorff, uh, two famous names from that period of time. And like, you know, in like most cases, when you have a war that goes badly, and this one was going very badly for the Germans at this time, usually revolution ends things. Uh, there's a revolution and, uh, and uh, just roughly right about the same time, there was a revolution going on in Russia, the Bolshevik revolution, which we can talk about at a different time, because that might be interesting. So that's Germany during World War I, and here's the Kaiser Wilhelm II. He finally has to abdicate, and that's the end of their empire. So you can see that uh, he's being saluted here by a, a bunch of his men. I suppose that's probably before the war, because <laughs> at this point, they probably weren't too happy with him or the way that things are going, um, and a lot of people were probably on the way out. 
trying to get back home, the, the ones that had, had survived. So it was an absolute terrible war, the war to end all wars. It really was the first world war because even in the Pacific, there was war going on with Germany and Japan there. And Russia was involved and uh, Europe was involved and finally United States was involved. So you guys all know the history. But, you know, I think too much emphasis is placed on World War II and not enough emphasis on World War I. Uh, because really that's where everything started, if you go back that far. Well, the World, the, the world War ended in uh, a treaty called the Treaty of Versailles. The victors, the, the big three here shown here, uh, showed up at, in France for the Treaty of Versailles. And there's Lloyd George, he's representing England, and you can see he's pretty much bewildered. Um, there's Clemenceau, Monsieur, and you can see he's a very angry person, very, very angry. And I guess he has a right to be. I mean, the Germans, he's, you know, he grew up, um, he probably lost some of his relatives in the Franco-Prussian War, probably remembers that and hates the Hun. And so, that that love affair has has not been lost on anyone. And then over here, here's Woodrow Wilson. He's just as clueless as ever. Um, and he even says that in his memoirs later on in life. So I don't know what good he's doing, but he was there for six months. And all these guys meet in Versailles in uh, outside of Paris. Remember Louis XIV's palace there that originally started out as a hunting lodge. But they met in the Hall of Mirrors and there were representatives from all of those countries that participated in the war. And obviously the big three were the United States and uh, France um, and, and England there. So you can see there's Lynn, <laughs> they're still, he's like, he's like he's bored. Um, there he is right there, just kidding, Lynn. Uh, so, uh, you know, they got around in the hall of mirrors and took some time and figured it out. And essentially it was extremely punitive, uh, essentially, the German people were responsible for everything and they've got to pay for all the damage to civilians on land, sea, air, everywhere. And it was completely their fault. And there was a uh, clause in there that says that they, yes, they take uh, full responsibility for the blame. And the cartoons uh, there in the United States and England, you can see making fun of this. And, you know, it's not like it was really a treaty which they had any agreement to. We give you until Monday to come up with their, to decide on our terms, which means you basically have to agree. And, oh, by the way, hey, we won the war. Remember, don't forget that. So we've got this bayonet at your chest and you pretty much have to do it. And that's the way that went. So finally, the treaty was signed. The war is over. Um, even Hil Wilson here says right here, treaty severe on Germany, says Wilson, but imposes uh, nothing she cannot do. So wouldn't that make you feel much better? Uh, you know, all the stuff that you do. So the Treaty of Versailles, pretty harsh. Um, it ended in, uh, the world ended in 11th of November, 1918. Uh, the Versailles Treaty by January, Wilson was leaving in June. They had to cede large tracts of land. I'm gonna show you a closer up map of that here in a second. Uh, and they needed, they wanted uh, 40 million tons of coal, but then also there were, um, multiple billions of dollars that they were going to owe as well. And then finally, they what they did was they moved the German government uh, to the city of Weimar in, in northern Germany. And, uh, and a cute little town, but obviously not Berlin, you know, not Frankfurt, not uh, you know, any Cologne, any of those other, other cities, not Stuttgart. Um, so here's what happened. If you take it, this is pretty interesting, really. If you look at what happened before the war, you can see the pink here, Germany and Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria down here, Turkey, but mainly Germany and Austria-Hungary see very, very large pieces here. And then after the war, you know, Germany kind of went back to its original state, but you see Poland just, just uh, um, sort of being created right here. So a lot of new states were created. So Poland was created, and then north of that was East, East, East Prussia, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Um, beautiful country if you've never gotten up there, especially you want to try uh, uh, Tallinn, Estonia, a beautiful little town. But anyway, you've got um, Germany and Austria-Hungary before the war. Look at Austria-Hungary and then look at Austria and Hungary after the war, right? Huge. Of course, that's where Czechoslovakia was created. And, um, and then you can see Poland was created. And you see uh, Ukraine was over here. Uh, and Georgia was over here, uh, and Romania gained some some territory. Yugoslavia, Serbia, 
was absorbed into Yugoslavia and gained lots of territory. So that's where all the Slavs were now concentrated. Albania lost a little bit, um, but then the, I think Montenegro looks like it was absorbed into Yugoslavia. So you've got uh, a lot of changes there, a lot of changes. And then that was one of the big, big uh, problems that I think that happened later on with the Germans. That was a hard pill to swallow. Speaking of a hard pill to swallow, here's a cartoon about that very thing. And you've got uh, France, America, Italy, Japan, the British Empire, all squeezing on Germany and to accept these peace terms. You've got to swallow it or whether you like it or not. So that's pretty much exactly what happened. And I tell you, there were a lot of people that were angry about this. Uh, a lot of uh, military were angry about this. And in fact, there was one young German there who was a corporal who was infuriated about this. But a lot of these warriors had fought and felt like they had been betrayed. Now, honestly, they they, they didn't have a chance. And uh, it was a good thing that they stopped fighting because there were there was like in a whole generation of men that were now without um, without their lives and a whole generation of children that were without their fathers. Of course. They had to start paying the reparations right away. Um, they determined that Germany owed 132 billion marks, so that's $33 billion at the time, payable in annual installments of two and a half billion marks. And then the new republic, known as the Weimar Republic, made its first payment in, in 1921. So they thought they were going to be cute. You know, we owe all these, uh, we owe 132 billion marks. They thought they were going to be cute and they thought they were going to just print it, right? Hey, here's your here's your 132 billion marks. We got them all here for you. Come get them, right? But then the French are like, well, I don't know if that's going to work. I don't think that's going to work. So they decided, no, we're not going to do that. We need gold, and we need um, basically coal. And so the the, the Ruhr region right there between France and Germany, which was mainly German, Germany, the French just went in there. And, and basically took the coal. And there's nothing the Germans they could do about it because they had all their army, army had had to stand down. So by the end of the war, the German mark had lost half of its value. So, I mean, we've seen that here in the United States. I'll show you that in a little while. Um, but essentially prices were doubling, you know, every certain period of time. And it started off slow and then picked up over time. So once the Germans realized that, you know, hey, the French, and the allies, they don't want our money. Well, money was dumped back on the German people. And so all the gold and all the natural resources and all of the tangible items uh, were, were, were basically transferred to the allies and internally in, in, in Germany and also in Austria, you essentially just had this fiat paper and just paper money, paper money that just flooded the streets and you, they they got had so much money that they rather rather than just printing new money, they just would take a stamp, a red stamp, and stamp over it. So, you know, this is a thousand dollar bank bank note, thousand mark bank note, and they just stamped over it with a one billion dollar bank note. And that is that that's one way to create money right there. Just boom. I mean, that's scary, but it's not too unlike what's going on right now. Uh, if you think about what inflation does, it, it basically the things that you depend on, the things that you need, the things that you eat, things that you live on, those are commodities. And those commodities, you know, are traded based on uh, this, our currency. And when our currency gets out of whack, it, it really messes everything up and, and, and our commodities uh, go through the roof. So 10 million marks at that point. Now, remember, when this all started, it was basically four to one. So you could say, okay, two and a half million dollars is equivalent to two, 10 million marks. So two and a half million dollars would buy you a half a pound of meat, four eggs, or two pounds of tobato, uh, potatoes. That's not and, that's or, Riley, just in case you were wondering. Uh, bread, two million marks a loaf. So that's a half a million dollars for a loaf of bread. Well, that's better be delicious is all I can say. But that's that's the way it went and people were starving and there you had theft and you had prostitution and you have murder and all these other things that come along with um, terrible financial woes. If you take a look at the mark and how it held up to the dollar and really in the, from the years 1914 to 1919, you can see, you know, it, it just more or less doubled, which is not 
terrible, terrible. But then from 1919 to 1922, you can see it started getting out of control till five, finally you're five, your five million to the dollar in August, August, September, October, November, you go from five million to four to over four trillion. And that's just, that's crazy. So uh, I'm not saying that's happening here, uh, but one of the problems with Germany at that time is it was a closed environment. So those German marks aren't going anywhere. They're staying inside of Germany. And we see that all over the world. You see that in South America, you see that all throughout Africa where um, the US dollar is accepted all over the world. Uh, and so is the pound and so is the Euro and so is the yen and more and more is the Chinese yuan. Uh, and those are, those are really reserve currencies and the dollar was a reserve currency. And so the German mark uh, at this period of time just was trash. And so nobody, you couldn't go anywhere and spend that. So it's like the ruble, you know, no one's going to take the ruble. So maybe Cuba, <laughs> but I doubt it. Look at how this looked in terms of gold. Um, same kind of thing. You know, you had a price of uh, one ounce of gold, 170 marks, and then that more than doubled and then more than doubled again. And there was a brief period of deflation there. That's probably when people felt like maybe we are to hoard some gold or they probably started uh, selling a lot of gold at that time, but you can see it didn't last and hyperinflation took over. And by then it was just, it was just worthless. And so um, that happened pretty quickly there at the end, especially once people lost confidence. I mean, they were buying a paper on their way to work in the morning because in the, in the afternoon it would be worth it would be, it would cost three times as much. That's, that's the truth of the matter. And it really affected, you know, the kids, um, you see there, here are these kids, they, if, I mean, you want to ask yourself, number one, where's their father? Well, their father's dead most likely. Um, and this is money, just packages and packages of money. You have to remember these kids growing up and the, they didn't have money to play with. Their parents wouldn't give them money to play with. Uh, in fact, the parents were probably quite stingy with the money. The kids very rarely ever touched the money. But here they are playing with it and stacking it up. And, you know, it, it had to be very confusing to them. Not only are bombs dropping all around me and my dad is gone and everybody's dad is gone. And money that used to be worth something is now just our play toy that I guess we don't do anything with but play with it. It was so effective or such a terrible dramatic effect on on the kids that Bugs Bunny even came out with a, a cartoon entitled Too Many Carrots showing that you know too much of anything is is not good too much of anything even gold so you can see here that this girl and she's burning their their rice mark their the marks um, so it wasn't worth anything to do it wasn't worth anything to do anything with but to burn and then finally they were just sweeping it up in the, in the street you know and that's kind of one of the images that I remember early on of, of the Weimar Republic. And it's like, you can just imagine if these are your dollars and just to see U.S. dollars down there, so then the people are sweeping it up. That's incredible. And, you know, none of us have ever gone through this or seen this, uh, at least in the United States. I was in Russia uh, in 1993 when uh, the Russian government decided that all old rubles were no longer any good. So all 1992 rubles and all those rubles were no longer any good. And all the rubles that I had in my pocket were pre-1993 rubles. And, and then all of a sudden overnight, over the weekend, the, the rubles that I had, well, not that much, $1,200 maybe, but all of a sudden it's, it's worthless, you know, just over the weekend. Now the 1993 rubles were the good rubles, but, and if you were a citizen, you could trade in up to about $1,200 worth of old rubles for new rubles if you were a citizen. But if you're a tourist or you're a foreign student like myself, you're out of luck. Well, luckily, I was living with a family and I was able to get my host sister to to change out my rubles. So it didn't affect me. But there were a lot of people who were upset about that, as you can imagine. And I think it was probably intended to hit the mafia or, you know, things like that uh, to 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 take the their cash off the street. But but it was it was definitely a shock. and It was an eye opener for me. I was pretty young at the time. Uh, but uh, to come back here and, and witness, you know, the devaluation of our dollar, even though it's been slow, yeah, I have definitely been able to see, I've, been, I've definitely been able to see it, and you can too. Now, I'm sure you have been able to. Now, at this time, uh, remember the uh, Germans owed reparations to the Allies, 
And also at the same time, the Allies owed a lot of money to the United States who had loaned them tons and tons of money, billions actually. So they had to come up with a plan because, you know, hey, they're not going to get their money back at this rate. We're not going to get paid back at this rate, folks. We've got to do something. So this guy, Charlie Dawes, comes up with a plan. And <clears throat> strangely enough, it's called the Dawes Plan. So the Dawes Plan basically puts a committee together and their whole their whole goal here is to find a solution for the collection of the German debt. That's the goal is we got to get these guys, figure out a way for these guys to pay their debt back because, you know, if, if the golden goose dies, then nobody's happy, right? Including the golden goose. So um, we got to find a solution for this. So 1924, here's what they come up with. Well, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to refinance, basically. And we've all seen that. Maybe you had a loan out for five years, and now we're going to refinance it for 15 years. That's essentially what happened. The big, big thing that happened, though, was the United States lent money to the German government and their industry so that they could get back on their feet. But more importantly, it allowed the German government to start paying those reparations back to the Allies. So wasn't that nice of them? And then, of course, um, they reorganized the German currency and stabilized it because now essentially it's being backed by the dollar. That's essentially what's that's what's happening. So everybody is happy. Essentially, let's take a look what happened here. The United States loans two and a half billion dollars to Germany. OK, great. Germany then takes that two two billion dollars and they pay that back to the allies, mainly France and England. In the, in the form of reparations. So two and a half million dollar, billion dollars in loans to Germany. Germany keeps a half a billion um, and then pays the Allies back two billion. And then the Allies turn around then and pay the United States back 2.6 billion in, in debt payments. So, um, I mean, if you, it worked. I don't know if, if you look at it, it's, it's like a, it's basically, you know, a shell game, but it, it worked. And um, you know, we were no worse off, I guess, because we ended up with getting our debt paid back by the Allies, at least some of it, and then now Germany owned us. So basically, we're just switching our debt from, we were refinancing our debt from the Allies to Germany in just over a longer period of time. So that made that made sense, and, and it worked. So that happened to uh, really satisfy um, the world market, especially internal, internally in Germany and also in Europe. Of course, you know, you got all this money moving around, sloshing around. So there was a new uh, bank system that was needed. So the new bank system comes into play to facilitate all these transactions. And this is where we get the Bank of International Settlements that, that, uh, that is in Basel, Switzerland. That will be our topic of next time. So even though this was pretty brief about Weimar Republic, it, it has some lessons to it. So let's talk about that. What are the lessons that we learned here? Well, I think that the main <clears throat> lesson that we could all learn is you can't take a piece of paper and attach value to it and then and then have more paper and, and, and hold the same value. OK, so the more paper that you have, the more currency units of currency that you have in circulation, the less each unit of currency is going to be worth. And it doesn't matter how much you print or what you call it, you're not going to be able to create new value. You're not going to be able to create food. You're not going to be able to create, you know, clothing. You're not going to be able to create shelter. You're not going to create medicine. Uh, you just create a bunch of paper. And, you know, that's something that we um, haven't, it amazes me that we're not, that we don't talk more about that in, in our community and, and on TV and in the news media um, or especially on social media, but I guess no one is, you know, it's kind of a boring topic. My grandmother passed away last year, a couple of years ago, and I was going through some of her mail and I happened across a bunch of old um, pieces of mail that had been stamped, some post stamped. And uh, you can see here that it goes from 1967 to 1977. It was just interesting because here we are in 1967 and the postage was five cents. And then in 1968, a year later, it was six cents. That's a 20 percent increase. And then in 19, by 1974, we were up to eight cents. And then 10 years later, we had essentially doubled. We had gone from five cents to 10 cents. And a lot of people look at this and say, oh, well, you know, 
<clears throat> it got more expensive to, to mail a letter. Well, no, really, not really. The mailing the letter has always been the same. It's been the same forever. You, you have an envelope, you put a letter in it, you seal it up, you put it in a, a box, mailbox. Someone comes and gets it, take it to another mailbox, and that person opens it and reads it. That hasn't changed. It hasn't changed in you know, maybe a thousand years. Uh, in our country, it hasn't changed in several hundred. So people, you know, in fact, with, with technology and with transportation and with cars and planes and automobiles and, and, and everything, it ought to be cheaper, right? But it's not. It's more expensive. And during that period of time, uh, the price of stamps doubled. But it didn't stop in 1977. It keeps on going. You can see here the price of stamps has continually, continually risen, you know, and it's not that mailing a letter is more expensive or more sophisticated or anything. It's simply that the value, the purchasing power of our money has decreased by that much. You know, from 1967 to 1977, you lost 50%. 50, or you lost 100, yeah, 50%. So, um, that's that should be concerning for anyone, you know, and it's just not this country. It's almost every single country in the in the in the world. And certainly some continents are worse than ever than others. Um, but again, it's because of the borders of our, our money. The United States can print dollars and they will go everywhere in the world. But if you're in Argentina, for instance, I mean, Brazil doesn't want your Argentinian money. Chile doesn't want your Argentinian money. So you know, only Argentinians want your Argentinian money and they don't really want much of it because you keep printing it. And this goes on and on and on again. If we look at the United States, and of course, here's the illusion that I'm finally making, right? This is our money supply. And it's hard to see the, the, um, the vertical lines, but essentially uh, there are some recessions in here. There was one in 2000, you may remember, there was another one in 2006 and 2007, but you know, we had a nice gentle slope here going on for a while. And remember, this over here is billions of dollars. So that's two trillion, four trillion, six trillion, all the way up now to twenty trillion dollars. And if you watch the US debt clock, I think it's usdebtclock.org, check it out. I mean, it's it's constantly winding, winding, you know. I mean, we're just printing money, just it's it's um, it's astronomical at this point. And, you know, essentially this is, a lot of this represents debt. And the question is, what, who's gonna pay this back? When is it ever gonna be paid back? I mean, are we just kidding ourselves here? Is we ever gonna pay this back? We're at 120% of GDP now. That means that 120% uh, of our GDP, gross domestic product, is, uh, is what our debt is. So we would have to all work for a year, 1.2 years in order to, uh, to, to pay our debt uh, without you know, consuming anything, food, medicine, healthcare, nothing else, which is obviously impossible. So this is where we are, this is where we're left. And this is one of the lessons that at least I have learned from history, especially the Weimar Republic, even though it's more of a sort of a microcosm, you still can see this going on all over the planet today. And that's what happens with inflation because when governments get in control of the, of the printing press, they cannot help themselves. They cannot help themselves. They, they just print it. They just cannot help. It's free money to them. But what happens really is it steals the value of our money out of our pockets. So it's just another taxation. And it's, it's, and it's the most insidious because you don't see it happening. And it hurts the people who can afford it the least, the most. And those are the poor people, people who are living off Social Security and things that are, you know, a stable type of uh, retirement. And then if you have savings and then they drop the interest rates down to zero and you're living off Social Security and your CDs, what are they doing to you? I mean, it's killing, it's killing our, it's killing our retirees, it's killing our poor people. And uh, it's just something that we need to talk about as a society and come to grips with. Otherwise, uh, our grandchildren are just, are really going to have a hard time as if we all already. So that's what we call our M2 money stock. And so, you know, the thing that bothers me the most is this sort of vertical tra trajectory here that we've all gotten used to. And I, based on what I hear in politics, it doesn't sound like that's going to taper anytime soon. So that's my biggest, one of my biggest concerns, to be honest with you. Switching now back to our financial series. Today, we talked about the Weimar Republic. We talked about the Dawes plan. We just touched on the Bank of International Settlements. That's what we're going to talk about next time. 
along with, you know, World War II just goes along with that. Um, and then Bret Wood's agreement is, was a major cornerstone of, of how our current system is today, although it's, it's changed dramatically. And now we are dealing with the IMF and the World Bank. And that's probably, folks, going to be our future, if I had to guess. Um, I definitely know they're planning on that. So, again, um, let's just you know, take, it, take it in bite-sized pieces here. And so we want to talk about now the Bank of International Settlements and, uh, and how that was put together in order to distribute the money to the DAWs plan. But it evolved into something very different than just that. It's still around today and exists in Basel, Switzerland. It's right next to the train station. If you go there, just walk right out and walk to the left and then walk about 50 paces and look to the right and it's right there. So small little town, cute little town. Uh, and uh, you wouldn't really know that the world's most powerful bank is right there. So if you want to get ready for that discussion, which probably in a couple of months, two or three months from now, because we're going to change these out. Um, and you want to get ahead of the game, go ahead and pick up this book called The Tower of Basel, Basel, Switzerland, by Adam Labor, and, um, and it's pretty interesting. So this is, this is where we're going to be taking a lot of our information from our, uh, our next uh, financial series webinar. And uh, if you read this bank, at the, uh, this book, you might, you might have some good questions to come up with and, and, and enjoy it even more. So I appreciate you guys listening in, and we're going to go ahead and take some questions now. If you feel like you had enough of this, I certainly understand, <laughs> and you can go ahead and, uh, and walk away. The rest of you, if you have some questions, go ahead and enter those now. I'm going to see if I can find a way to get to those questions. If I don't find them, I certainly apologize. Oh, here we go. Q&A. Okay. No questions at all. Wow. That's fantastic. So, um, all right. So everybody understands, everybody agrees with me completely. And, um, and I really appreciate you guys joining today. Um, I hope you like the financial series. I think it was probably a good idea. I want to educate everyone to, as to how our money works, because if you understand that, it makes it easier on my end when I know we're doing this or that. But um, I mean, our, our educated person is our best client. So we appreciate you all out there. I wanted to say thank you to each and every one of you. And thank you um, again to all of our long-term clients and thank you to our veterans and thank you to our frontline workers. Oh, I do have a question that just popped out. Shamps, example of stamps. I assume that you like the example of stamps. Thanks a lot. I thought so too, because it's a real life example, right? I mean, there they are postmarked. I mean, it was Decatur, Georgia, Cordial, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. I mean, right there. So in front of your face, you saw you saw your uh, purchasing power decrease by 50% right there. So hopefully that's not going to depress you today. <laughs> it's almost time for lunch. So maybe you can have a uh, wine lunch. And I hope to see everybody really soon. Take care of yourself.